What do you think of people that talk to themselves? I mean, what do you think of those kind of people? You do it all the time? Yeah. Let's be honest. Yeah, everybody's shaking their head. We all talk to ourselves. Now, I was in San Diego a few weeks ago on a few days of vacation with my wife, and we'd stayed at a downtown hotel, and it didn't have parking. Well, the truth is it had parking, but it was like $40 a night. And so I was too cheap to pay the, pay the parking. So I parked the car, my car, about four blocks up from the hotel where it was free. Until 8 in the morning, you had to put money in the meter by 8 in the morning. And um, so uh, I got up and had a cup of coffee. And then I walked up about four blocks to, uh, to put money in the meter. And there was all kinds of people out at that time of the day. I was like, What's that? what is everybody doing out? And of course... There was a, quite a few homeless people downtown San Diego. It's warm and great place to be homeless, I guess, if you have to be. But uh, um, I was kind of walking up the street. I was just having, I had a coffee and I was, you know, I was just kind of minding my own business. And I kind of walked past a guy and I saw him out of the corner of my eye and he was sitting kind of in a little entryway of a building. And, and as I got uh, just about abreast to him, uh, again, I didn't even hardly look at him, but I, I kind of saw him and he went, Hey! And he just scared the just snot out of me. Just, he screamed and he started yelling. And I jumped and I thought, my first thought is, I thought he was yelling at me. And then as I kept walking, I realized he was talking to himself. He was just, you know, he was just having this huge argument with somebody, his, his imaginary friend or something. And, uh, but, you know, talking to ourselves is, uh, is, is really, we all do it. Now, he may do it really loud, but, but we do it. You may do it loud when you're alone. That's up to you, I guess. But uh, in the mirror at night, just laying around when your brain goes into neutral, you, everybody hears it, right? We all hear this thing we call self-talk. And um, tonight I want to kind of talk about that, of, of preaching uh, to yourself. And that may sound really odd. And, uh, but let's, I want to look at the scripture. A guy by the name of Paul Tripp, he's a pastor from... Uh, I believe him down in Southern California, and a speaker. He says this, no one is more influential in your life than you are because no one talks to you more than you do. You think about all the words that have been spoken to you in your life by teachers, parents, friends, whatever, you know, but you know, none of the, you could add up all those words that have been spoken to you, good or bad, by all the people that have been around you your whole life. But the words you've spoken to yourself would far outstrip all those words if you really thought about it. No one talks to you more than you do. So you have to ask yourself the question, well, how's that going? What's the conversation sound like? More importantly than that, what does it produce in me? What does it sound like and what does it produce in me? I don't know about you, but do you remember your self-talk when you were in middle school? Do you remember what that was like? Was that a real affirming voice in your life? You're just the best. Man, you're a studly. Everybody should love you. I mean, you're just so secure. I mean, really, come on. Was middle school just a really warm, affirming voice? No, it wasn't. I don't think high school got much better. Uh, and maybe even out of high school. Maybe even today, you're 50 years old and you're still like, I hate listening to myself. Um, I don't know about you, but when I'm having a conversation with myself, which I often do, when I'm thinking, and this, if, if, if there's a question of whether I'm doing okay, I, I often will fill in the blank very negatively. I don't, I don't, and maybe it's because I'm, maybe I'm the half, glass is half empty kind of a guy, but, but I, I fill in the blank for when it's about me, I often tend to fill it in negatively. It takes other people to come around and say, no, no, man, you, that's a, you did a great, oh, that was, you know. I remember the very first time I ever preached. I was, it was years ago. And the pastor who invited me to do it said, I want you to do, I'd only been a Christian a few years. And I was, pretty, I was very rough around the edges. And he came up and said, I want you to prepare a message for Wednesday night service. And I was like, well, I've never done it. He goes, I know, just, just here's how you do it. And I had no training at that time. And I was like, but I'd seen him do it. I think, well. And so I kind of worked for hours and hours and hours and hours for a 35-minute message or whatever it was. And I got up there and I did it. And there was maybe 50 or 60 people in the room. It was a small church in Northern California. And I just, when I, got, I just couldn't wait to get done. I just like, oh. 
this is awful. I hope I just I hope I'm not ruining the whole church and and um, I sound like an idiot and I don't have any idea what I'm talking. Just I mean the filling in the blank was I just so remember that I was about oh I don't know 25 at the time and and. Um, so anyway, they ended the service and people came up and he, he prayed for people and this and that. And I was just gathering my stuff and I was sitting uh, uh, over on this side. He came up and sat down and he, he just kind of sat there for a second. He was, he was a really, just a wise guy. He'd, he'd been around a long time and he just sat next to me, didn't say anything for about a, about a minute. And then he looked at me and said, I bet you just feel awful. And I was like, Yes! You saw it too. <laughs> I knew it was awful. No, 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 he said. He said, I'm not talking about what you did. I'm just talking about how you feel. He said, you probably feel awful, don't you? I said, yeah. He goes, that's, that's always like that the first time. He goes, it's just the devil. He said, you have a gift. And he said, don't ever forget it. Don't let the devil steal it from you, man. You were just fine. It was, that, was, that, was a, that was a huge defining moment in my life. Because I did feel awful, and I didn't know why, but I just thought I'd bombed terribly, and I was, you know, already my career was washed up. And uh, he's like, no, no, it happens all the time, first time out. He said, uh, don't let the devil steal it from you. It's really interesting. I remember that as I was getting ready, ready, ready for this tonight. There's a guy by the name of um, uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he says this, have you realized that most of your un- unhappiness in life is due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself. Isn't that interesting? Take those thoughts that come to you the moment you wake up in the morning. You've not originated them, but they start talking to you. And what do they say? They bring back problems from yesterday. Maybe they bring up problems of tomorrow. I'm I'm ad-libbing a little bit. But somebody is talking to you. Somebody is talking Yourself is talking to you. But if, think of the, the, the first line there, if you can go back a half slide there, Ray. Have you realized that most of your unhappiness in life due to the fact that you're listening to yourself instead of talking to yourself? Yeah. Who's ever had that thought go through your mind? Why am I such an idiot? Oh, I don't know. Is that like a rhetorical question? It's like, <laughs> is there a multiple choice that I can check the boxes on? But, but think about that, you know, gosh, what am I doing that's working? Where's, the good, where's God's goodness followed me around? Um, so I want to look at, the, we're gonna, we'll circle back to that. Um, I want to I wanna, I wanna go back to the psalm that I started with at the beginning of the service in Psalm 42. And there's um, 11 verses, I believe, in this psalm. And uh, this is a psalm of David. And this is a psalm of a, of a guy who's, uh, who's in trouble. Uh, we don't know exactly what was going on, but if you know the life of David, he, he had some troubles that he ran into in his life. Uh, uh, problem people, problem giants, crazy kings, made some bad decisions. Uh, so it wasn't like the guy was a perfect, problem-free guy. But um, he wrote this psalm. And so I'd just like to kind of read through the psalm, and we can make a few comments, or you're welcome to make a few comments, and then... Uh, We'll leave you with some takeaway here. So he writes this, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. Where can I go and meet God? What, what, just, real, just fire away here real quick. We're a small enough group. What do you hear there in that first, that first, uh, first verse? What do you hear? Verse section. What do, you, what do you hear? Do you hear what, what's the emotion, or what's what? What do you think's going on? We don't know for sure, but let's let's make up our thing here. What? What do you think is going on when he says that? And is is he is he kind of in the easy time of life? Is he just in line at Disneyland, just getting ready to go in? Is he just won the lottery? What's he's longing? Okay, yeah, that's kind of in there, right? Panting, my soul pants, my soul thirsts. Yeah, desperate. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's a great word. It seems like this guy is kind of desperate, right? Like something's going on. Like uh, when you get a picture of a deer panting for water, there's like, you, you know, we, we know what that's like when we've run a, a long way in the heat of the day or we're working like, oh, or when you're hungry, I'm dying of, of hunger. I'm dying of thirst. Not really, but you're panting, right? Yeah, you know, you think about, we could be this guy. I mean, I mean, I think all of us at some point in our lives uh, I, I would imagine, I would guess that we've all been this guy. And, and this guy's not some crazy 
atheist, hedonist, you know, heathen. This is David the psalmist, and yet he's saying, hey, where's the, where can I, I need to have, I need a meeting with God. <laughs> and so somewhere there's this desperation thing as a result of whatever was going on in his circumstances, and he's like, I'm in a, I'm in a, I'm in a tight spot, and I need to meet with God. Have you ever, uh, when you wouldn't, have you ever had a close friend where you, you call him up and say, hey, we, we just got to have coffee. I, I, I really need to have a coffee with you. Because um, their companionship, maybe, or just their wisdom, or just their friendship is an encouragement to you, right? And so in a way, he's saying, God, we, we got to have coffee this week. That doesn't, I know that sounds weird, but, but think about this, that you know, we make appointments with our friends and we block out an hour. We put it in our calendar. We drive there, we show up, we pay money to listen to the counsel, hopefully, of our friends. And he's saying, God, I got I to gotta block, where are you? Because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to meet you there. I'm going to block out the time. I'll pay the price. I'll buy, but I've got to talk to you. And then, of course, in verse 3, we get a little bit of an idea of why the desperation. <clears throat> my tears have been my food day and night while people say to me all day long, where is your God? So now we get a little bit more context of maybe why the, why the state of mind. One is um, he's surrounded by people who have been taunting him and saying, where is your God? Have you ever... Uh, Maybe you're too good a Christian to kind of entertain this kind of a thought, but have you ever entertained the thought of, hey, God, like, yeah, I'd like to know that too. That's my question. Where are you? Like, that's, that's what my atheist friends are saying, but honestly, when they go away, I'm kind of like, where are you? In the midst of this trial, in the midst of this situation, in this hospital room, in this place of the rent being due in two days. Like, where are you? I think those words are, are more, more common than we know, huh? You, know, you think about this in our daily lives. This, remember what we read at the beginning? We're listening to ourselves rather than talking to ourselves. So in a way, he's remembering. He said, my tears have been my food while people say to me all day long. So listen carefully in verse three. Go Read it slow. My tears have been my food. So I haven't had a good day or a good week or we don't know how long, but things have not gone well because what I've listened to is the taunt of, so where's your God? Christian, David, songwriter, king, warrior, where's your God now? Where's your God? Where's your God? You know, and, and again, if, if that's all he's listening to, you know, that's a, that's a very, that's kind of a, that's kind of a, a taunt, a hopeless taunt, isn't it? So this God you believe in is nowhere to be seen. So maybe you're a fool. Maybe he's not God. Maybe, I mean, all, and then you, can, you see what I'm saying? See how that self-talk can just start to take off? But it's interesting in verse four, he, in a sense, he, he jumps to the other side of, of sort of uh, this, this argument. You know, so, so it's like this side is saying, so where's your God? Where's your God? And so now he jumps over to this side and says, you know what I'm going to remember? As I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. So there's this little oasis of memory. This oasis of memory, like, man, I remember when we were all on board with this. I don't know how old David was. No one really does when he wrote this. But you know, over the last few years, I've talked to a, a significant number of people who have been Christians 20, 25, 30 years who are struggling deeply with their faith. Like asking this very thing, hey, where's, where's the God I've believed in? Where's the God I used to feel presence. Where's the God that used to come on my behalf? You know what's crazy? Uh, Mother Teresa said something. That when she said it, she was immediately kind of picked apart in the media for it. But when she said it, it so resonated with me. 
She said this right before she died in an interview. You know who Mother Teresa is, right? I mean, she was just, wasn't she just uh, beatified the saint? She became a saint, the Pope. And, and she said, the older I get, the less I hear God. You're like, what? But she said, the older I get. And you know, I don't know about you, but if you, uh, you know, about how long have you been a, a Christian? You've been a Christian a few years. 42 years. 42 years. Uh, and, and were you raised in church or did you get saved later? Uh, saved at 22. Saved at 22. So was your conversion in church or was it some, a little bit? It was uh, in an apartment. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I'm just listening to you. I know you guys can all hear that, but, but you know, I was 23 when I became, my wife and I became believers, a very, sounds like a very similar situation. We were freaks and then we became Jesus freaks. We were just kind of just the, the hippie thing. And, 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 and when we became believers, I remember the same sense of being in, uh, coming into a community of believers, really, really reading the Bible for the first time in my life and understanding it. Um, being in times of worship where the presence of God was just thick. And, and, and it was like God was speaking to me every time I sat down. I felt like God was just saying something to me. I could read the Bible and get so much out of it. But you know what's crazy is as those years go by, I, I don't know if it's just age or if it's, if it's but it's almost like, like God would wean you. It's almost like he dumped on you in the early days. And then he almost like weans you off of feelings, or, or not. Maybe, maybe it's just me, but, but I, I, it's not to say that I still don't have those times and, I, and God isn't real, but it's, it's, it's like it's not as superficial as it was. It's not as, as light as it was. It, I, it's, I've been forced to dig a deeper well, if you, if you know what I mean. And I think you've got in this guy here, he's remembering Man, I remember when, we, when the whole crowd was on board with God and, and everything was great and the voice of, a, of an accuser, the voice of a naysayer was nowhere to be found. We were all just praising God together and no more. Where's God? You know, you may find yourself in a season of dryness. And, and if, if you, as a believer, you're going to have, I believe everybody's going to have seasons of the desert and, and seasons of plenty. But again, I think what we're talking about tonight is in, in the seasons of plenty, I just feel like, okay, I'm, I'm just, God's carrying me. But in seasons of desert, I feel like, where is? And then he says, verse five, he turns and he preaches to himself. Listen, listen, my soul. He, he, he's, in, he's like, he's in his own soul's face. Listen, why are you so downcast? Why are you disturbed within me? There's, there's no suggestion. This is, these, are, these are imperative tenses. You put your hope in God. It's almost like he's commanding his soul. For I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. Isn't it interesting? He says, don't miss the order. Put your hope in God and you're going to praise him again. And, and, and there's this sense of calling himself out, calling, calling his soul on the carpet and saying, you stop it. Just, you ever see that Bob Newhart skit? <laughs> just stop it. That's an awesome skit if you haven't seen it, but it's just, you know, it's a, it's a classic counseling if you haven't seen it, brother. <laughs> Every counselor, I think, has to watch that in school, right? But um, he's, he's calling himself out on the carpet and saying, you got to stop it. You know, I hear people say all the time, well, I, I just... I can't do it unless I feel it. That's baloney. That's just not true at all. Listen, you do, you and I do all kinds of things every day. Or people will say this, well, you know, I just can't fake it in worship. I just can't come in and raise my hands and pretend. No one's asking you to pretend. He's just saying to his soul, do it. I don't care how you feel. Because think about everything else you do and you don't, do you feel like getting out of bed some mornings? No, but you do. Do you feel like taking a shower? No, but you probably, you do or you should, right? <laughs> do, you, do, you, do you feel like combing your hair, brushing your teeth? No, but you do. You don't like, oh, I just can't wait to brush my teeth. No, but follow what I'm saying here. You do it and it's a habit because you know it's good for you. And afterwards you're like, yeah, glad I did that. And other people are like, me too, right? <laughs> The point is, is that we do all kinds of things without some deep gush of emotion. 
oh, I just have to feel this, or it's just not meaningful to me. That's baloney. That is just, that's just ridiculous. And people who, and honestly, I hear people say to me a lot, I just can't participate in worship because I just can't fake it. No one's asking you to fake it. We're just asking you to do it. What do you mean by that, Bruce? Well, here's what I mean. I mean that I stand up and I say no to my phone and the game and, and all my thoughts, and I sing what is on that screen, and I reflect on it. I open my mouth. I raise my hands. And I want to tell you, guess what? You know, you, you're, you'd be amazed sometimes of how, if you stick with it, feeling will follow actions. Feeling follows actions. If I wait to feel everything, there's a lot of things that are not going to get done in my life. Let's see, should I pay my property taxes? I don't feel it, right? But we don't, we're, we'd be crazy. That's just such a cop-out to say I don't feel it. Now, are feelings important? Sure. But are they the most important thing? Should feelings be? I want to slow down and say this again. Are feelings important? Sure. But are feelings the governing thing in my life? I hope not. I hope not, your reason is, I hope not on a number of levels. One is because there's a whole industry out there that wants to manipulate my and your feelings. You ever just, you know what I'm talking about, manipulate your feelings? You know, you just got done eating dinner and, and the commercial comes on and the cheese is just dripping off the edge of that pizza or that nacho plate or whatever and all it's like, man, I, I'm kind of hungry. I don't, I mean, you know, I just ate, but I kind of, I'm going to go and see if there's any chips in the cupboard, right? You've just been manipulated, your feelings. I mean, I could, I could come up here and, and, and do comedy or, or sad tragedy and manipulate your feelings. But mature people, adults, are done with that kind of a thing. Oh, woe is me. I, I just don't feel it. He preaches to himself. My soul, verse 6, is downcast within me. I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, the Mount Misar. So verse 4 and verse 6, you see this pattern of memory, of memory. Listen, don't underestimate the power of memory. Have you ever... Um, have you ever been somewhere and a song comes on that just triggers? Like just triggers, oh, I remember that. That was my first date. You just start weeping. Or you remember where you were when that song was on, that summer song or something? You know the song we sang earlier? How did it go? Um, uh, gosh, what was it? How did, hang on just a second. The, um, what were the lyrics, Johnny? Yeah, I remind myself of all that you've done and the life I have because of your son. That song portrays exactly what worship is about and what we're talking about. Worship is to remind myself of all that he's done. You know, in a dark moment, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times I've been involved in a marital situation where there's, there's friction or or potential tragedy, it's about to come apart. And I literally make them verbalize. Tell me how you got into this in the beginning. Talk about where you met. Talk about when you started dating. Talk about when you first got married. And inevitably, as they start to talk about it, they literally start to soften at the table. I could tell you story after story that as they begin to just process again how they got, because they're not remembering how they got into it. All they know is they're both angry and they're both stubborn and hard and they're waiting for the other person and they're just, they're kind of in this defensive, aggressive thing. But as they begin, I'm not saying it solves everything, but listen, in moments of trial, Bob has, I'm not gonna guess your age, 42 years. Bob has four decades of history with God. You know, I don't know if you like journaling. This is a little side note, but um, a side commercial, but you know what journaling is? You get a blank book and you just write down things that God has said as you read the word. That's powerful stuff. That's like your history in writing. Don't lose that kind of a thing. I don't know about you. You think, uh, you may have a great memory, but it'll fade sooner or later. Just like your abs. It's gonna go away. <laughs> It may be good now, but it's not going to be good forever. And listen, you need, isn't it interesting that in the Old Testament, God would make them pile rocks as memorials. No one's going to steal rocks. 
He would make them pile rocks so that they could look back and go, man, that day in this place, God delivered us. I think some of our, you know, I'll say this, the most devastating disease in the Old Testament killed more people than anything else was not leprosy, was not the plague, was not an army. It was a bad memory. More people died because they forgot God than any other enemy that could ever come on the scene. And that's not just the hyperbole. Look that up. When people forgot God, an entire generation went into the wilderness to die. An entire generation. You've got to go back to your history. And he said, deep calls to deep, in verse 7, in the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves and breakers have swept over me. And now you can almost see this guy's, the flow of conversation, his inner talk begin to shift. He is actually preaching to himself and the momentum has turned and gone the other way. You know, the word momentum is very important there. Because if, you, if you're coming from a place of really negative momentum, ungodly, untrue momentum. In other words, if you have, um, let's just say, let's just say growing up, the people, the important people in your life, the most influential people in your life, mother and father, or someone really close to you that had access to your emotional life and it was negative and it was critical and it was biting if, if that's been the flow of talk going your direction, you have what I call this, this, this bad momentum. Because when push comes to shove, the tape's going to click on. The tape is going to click on. I, I grew up, in, in, personally, I, I, grew up in, I grew up in Chicago. Chicago, if you know anything about the culture of Chicago, it's a very cynical culture. It's a very cynical city. Uh, Everybody's an idiot until proven otherwise. That's kind of how it is. I'm serious. It's crazy. It's awful. It's a very biting. You know, if you've been in New York, New Yorkers are kind of loud and brash, but Chicago are loud and brash, and they're just... And so every joke is sarcasm at your expense. It, it's, uh, and you can look at some of the comics that have come out, the Belushi brothers and the others that have come out of Chicago, and you, and you see this, this, this style. And so this is what I grew up with, my own brother and my friends. And, and man, I had just a boatload of just junk on the hard drive of my brain. My teachers, my coaches, everybody who had positions of influence in my life. I can, on one hand, count the number of people that I would look back and say, oh yeah, he or she was a positive, affirming, truth-telling influence in my life on one hand and less than that, probably. honest. And I'm not saying, oh, woe is me. I'm just saying that when I became a believer, God began to, to weed out that in a moment of trial or in a moment of, of conflict, in a moment of something, that little loop tape would just kick in and, oh, you know what, Bruce? You're too stupid to do that. You know what, Bruce? You're too this, you're too that. And that self-talk would kick in. And then faith was really hard to maintain. I, I, I really believe, I'm not talking about some psycho thing here, but I really believe that, see, what, what we're talking about here is I'm gonna either believe what others have said about me or I'm gonna believe what God says about me. He says, by day the Lord, I'm gonna go back to that, directs his love. At night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God? And now he repeats himself. Five and 11 are identical. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. This is one of my favorite psalms. This, there's an interesting companion psalm to this. It's almost, it's almost identical in flow. It's Psalm 73. You can read it at your leisure, but read Psalm 73 sometime. They're almost identical in the sense of uh, 
of what the heck is going on in this guy's life. Now, Psalm 73, however, was written by the worship leader that worked for David named Asaph. They're written by two different people, but they're very similar in their flow. Where is God? I'm surrounded by people that taunt me and mock me and say, oh yeah, really? God, where are you? I know you're there, but you seem like you're silent. Where are you? And God's big enough to handle that. This thing of this struggle. Um, I'm gonna give you four things quick here, take away. If, if, I could, if I could give you four things that I would hand off in this practical things. So what do you do? You just stand in front of the mirror and say, you're great, you're wonderful, I believe in you. That's not what I'm saying. Because that's not gonna help. Because inside of me, some of the stuff that's said against me is, is true. You know what I mean? Some of the criticism is justified. Most of those people in my life that were negative influences in my life, I actually, I deserve that. I asked for it because of my, my own attitude and my own, my own stupidity and my own rebellion as an unbeliever in those days. So I'm not talking about, hey, let's just turn this around you and I in the mirror. No, 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 not at all. Number one is this. You got to put your gaze back on the only one, the opinion that really matters on Christ. You want you to gaze on the beauty of Jesus. Let that sink in. Why is that important? Pardon? Yeah. Yeah, that's who we want to reflect. Yeah. You know, A.W. Tozer, uh, he's a writer from last century, around the 1950s and 60s. He wrote a book called The Pursuit of God. And there's a chapter in the book that he, I believe is titled The Gaze of the Soul. And the truth is that we become like what we stare at. So who has not seen a little boy watching a movie, superheroes or athletes, and immediately goes out and creates a costume to mimic what he just saw? It so impresses this little boy. We become, we begin to take on, we begin to absorb what we stare at. So if you stare at porn, you become, you, you have a pornographic mind. And once you stop staring, you can look away and, you're just, the, and the tape just keeps rolling on what you just stared at, right? Just keeps on rolling. If you stare at perfection and you turn away, this is my idol, this is my ideal, that's what idolatry is. This is isn't it interesting that God, Jehovah God, Yahweh, forbid you shall have no other graven images before me. All the gods of the nations had something they could look at. Baal, Ashereth, Pole, something they could look at and go, these are your gods, the golden calves. And God said, you can't make anything that looks like me. Everything that's made by man is a cheap imitation. And that's the essence of idolatry, isn't it? But we stare at things thinking, oh, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to be. This is the affirmation I need from you. And I'm telling you, it's a, it's a flawed image. Gaze on the beauty of Christ. What does that mean? It just means to look at what Jesus did and what he was and how he responded and what he said. Just let it soak in. This may mean you have to turn off the television. Uh, someone asked me uh, at the, uh, we did a barn dance last night or what was it? The hoedown. And uh, I was sitting at a table with a, some young adults, and someone turned to me and said, hey, what's your, favorite, um, what's your favorite television sitcom? And I said, I don't actually have one. She goes, well, what's just, maybe it's not your, I, I said, the truth is, I don't have enough time. <laughs> I don't have enough time or energy that one could be, because I don't, I, the tr real truth is I don't even watch TV. What? I, mean, this, I think this young woman was like, <laughs> Really? I said, I'm sorry, my line of work, it's really, hard to, it's really hard to find some spare time to create a favorite. So this gazing on the beauty of Jesus, if you're trying to shift the momentum of your life and you can't do this, if you can't start here, it's gonna be a very difficult 
difficult road. I would suggest to you it's almost impossible. But if you just simply would begin to do this on a regular basis, somehow, and it doesn't have to be a 90-minute Bible study at 5.30 in the morning. You can do this in a whole bunch of ways. Just study the character. There's all, hey, if you want a great book, uh, A.W. Tozer, The Pursuit of God. Oh, you want a great book. You don't know where to start. Get that book. He wrote a companion book called The Knowledge of the Holy. It's just talking about the attributes of God. And, but when you, when you first read it, it's going to just seem like, wow, this seems like it was written 50 years ago. It was. It was. That's why you need to read it. There's stuff now that I read is like, it just seems, there's Christian stuff that's out there. It sounds like, it's just like cotton candy to me. It's not about the beauty of Jesus. It's about the, it's about the, the cleverness of man in Jesus' name. There's a, there's a vast difference between those two things. A vast difference. Number two, you got to remember our history and who we are. And this was what we talked about earlier, but you've got to remember your history, rehearse your history. My wife and I have this tradition we've done for years. We've been married for 37 years. And every anniversary... We figure out a way to get out of town for a day or go to dinner. We do something. We never miss an anniversary. It falls in December, so it's always a lot of competition. But we go away, and we find a way to sit down over dinner, and then we just talk about where we were. As we try to remember as far back as we can. 37 years is a long time, for me anyway. Uh, but what we do is we just sit there over dinner, and we just rehearse our history. Oh, yeah, I remember that. For, I remember the first one and the second one. Then my mind kind of goes blank for a few years. I think there's gaps, right, Bob? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, like, oh yeah, flash. But, but we just, what we do is we just rehearse our history. We just talk about where we were. Oh, we didn't have, oh that was the first one where we had a son. And, oh, and then we had the kid. And then we were on the mission field. We, but man, talking about it, remember where God was during that time. You know what this is called? This is called, a, in maybe a Christian vernacular, this is a testimony, isn't it? A testimony is recounting what happened. Oh, I was broke, I was this, I was busted, I was in jail, I was a drug addict, I was, we were on the brink of divorce, and God came through. It doesn't matter how, but the fact is, if God didn't come through, it ain't a testimony, it's just you bragging about your dysfunction. <laughs> I think sometimes we're more impressed with our dysfunction than we are with God. I mean, seriously, have you ever heard anybody just talk about sometimes, it sounds like they're giving a testimony, but really, you're just bragging about your dysfunction, man. I think, listen, we have got to be, number one was number one for a reason. Because I can be really impressed with my dysfunction. Oh, woe is me. No one's worse than I am. Oh, you don't know who you're dealing with. Oh, I was such a drug abuser. And I start talking about everything I did. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to go take a shower. This is awful. We're more impressed with our own sin than we are with God's grace to overcome the sin. You know what that's called? That's called the sin of unbelief. Listen to me. That's the sin of unbelief. I believe I am better than God is good. That's unbelief. You've just, you've, we've missed the point. And sometimes I think people will struggle and struggle and struggle, excuse me, and go to counselor to counselor to counselor to counselor or church to church to church or hop all around thinking for the, they're looking for this magic answer. And the root of their problem, this, if there's nothing else you heard tonight, here it comes. Don't get me started. The root or root where you're from of the problem is unbelief, but they will never admit that. It's always something else. Listen, the root of, 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 of porn addiction is unbelief. Porn is just a symptom, man. The, the root of a marriage conflict is unbelief. You refuse to believe what God says and then act on that, but you're going to no, you're going to act on your anger. You're going to act on whatever he did or didn't do or she did or didn't do. The root of conflict, unresolved conflict, is unbelief. You don't believe that the grace of God can heal this, 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 this thing we have going. The, the, the root of pride, I mean, the, the, the sin of pride, all those are symptoms. The root of it is unbelief. Do I really believe what God says in his word? We could just end there. I got two more and we're done. Rest in his power and provision. There comes a time where you just have to do everything you can do. And then you just got to go, okay, God, I'm in your hands. You know, 
I've asked you where you are, but I'm saying I know you're there, but I just don't feel it. You know, you, 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 come on, you've been in Oregon in January and thinking it's been raining for like a year and a half, <laughs> right? The crazy thing is, right? You've been in Oregon in January just like, I'm gonna go crazy here. I have that, that was that seasonal disease thing, you know, if I don't see. But you know, the crazy thing is the sun is really shining. If you ever, you ever gotten on a plane or PDX in the pouring rain and all of a sudden you're like in the bright blue sky, you're like, oh, I could just live up here. If 30,000 feet, the sun is shining. I mean, so that's it. There's cloud cover in the circumstances of my life today. But up there, the sun, it's not that the sun's not shining. It's just that I happen to be under it. And I'm not, this is not my destiny. This is not my permanent condition. God, so I'm going to rest. And then the last one, of course, is to, to move and act. Because feelings follow action. Feelings follow action. You know, it's funny. Have you ever heard the saying... In, in missions or whatever, you ever heard someone say, oh, you know what, he's so, how does it go? He's so heavenly minded, he's no earthly good. You know what, I've never met anybody that was so heavenly minded they were no earthly good. But you know what, I've met hundreds of people that were so earthly minded they were no heavenly good. I have met probably, I would say, thousands, and I'm not exaggerating that they are so faithless and so unbiblical and so just lost in their junk and their stuff. And, 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 the, and the root of it is unbelief. It's like, I'm just gonna believe what my mom has said or what my PO says or what, my, what somebody close to me has labeled me as. And listen, if you're a son and a daughter, behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us, that we should be called the sons and the daughters of God. My sons and I have two boys. They're adults uh, right now, young men, married. When they were little, every day wasn't a bright, sunny day. I'm just like, they didn't just hit it out of the park every day. There were days where it, it was dark cloud cover, where they were disobedient or they were, just had gnarly attitudes or they would talk back to their mom or they would beat up on each other. We didn't have this perfect family. But you know what? There was a constant in there that allowed us to remain friends and be a family up to this day. And know what the constant was? You're my son. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do to change that. You are my son in whom I'm well pleased. You're my beloved son. I would say this to my kids, my two boys. You ask them all the time. In a card, in a text, when we were saying goodbye, you're my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You're not my beloved son in whom he's never made a mistake. I never said that because that's not true. But you see, I don't, they don't have to be perfect to be pleased, for me to be pleased because it doesn't depend on their behavior. But my behavior accuses me every day. It says, come on, so you're a Christian, so where's your God? In some form of those words. You can fall and go, oh man, I'm supposed to be a Christian and the devil's right there. He's right there. You know what the, Satan says? He's the, the word Satan means accuser of the brethren. But you know he's also a tempter. It says the tempter came and said, if you're the son of God. So it's almost like you're just standing there and this bird lands on your left shoulder and says, you know what? You should do this, do this, do this. No, you resist. And finally you give in and you do it. And then the bird flies to this shoulder and says, well, I can't believe you, you miserable wretch. He goes from being a tempter to an accuser. That's how that works. We got to understand the nature of the warfare against us. We got to stop feeling sorry for ourselves. Stop blaming other people. And say, God, you know what? I got to come back to the center here. Let's just pray. <laughs> Forgive us for just falling into the trap of unbelief that leads to a multitude of other sins and dysfunctions. We just repent tonight of agreeing with something that wasn't true and the grief it's caused us and the grief it's caused others.
I, this, is a, this is not in our series. I didn't plan this out really, so to speak. Uh, it's just kind of an off one standalone message, but I felt like God brought this to me to deliver tonight. So here it is. But I want to please, I want to beg you tonight to not be a passive listener. But to take that last one, to move and to act, relying on him. So if, if, if tonight God is dealing with you, what you've allowed to play, the channel that's playing in your head that is just simply not true. I don't know where that channel is tuned to, to your mother's voice or your father's voice or your friend's voice or some coach's voice or whatever, but somebody's voice that is just simply not telling you the truth. The problem is that voice means a lot to you. You're going to have to let it go. You're going to have to reject it and say, God, I want you to tune my life to the channel that is true and I want to ask your forgiveness for listening and agreeing with the voice of the accuser where that talk has become my talk I want to preach to myself tonight not a message of self-help, but a preach to myself, your word. What does your word say to me? Forgive me for neglecting that. I want you to take about 30 seconds and ask God, God, where... Where did this tape that keeps playing in my head identify it for me, Lord? Because it makes me depressed and angry or sad or I quit and I don't even realize it. It's because of the tape. Reveal it to me, Father, in this moment. And rip this tape out of the player and destroy it. is it that you keep repeating the lie you parrot the lie that paralyzes you God reveal I believe in this moment if you ask God he will he will pinpoint laser red hot he will pinpoint things that have been said over you or to you that now you repeat and you make them real it's become part of your life and he wants to expose those things Place them with truth. Ask the Lord tonight. Lord, what do you think of me? Do that just for a second. Lord, what do you think of me? I believe he'll speak to you.